Hello you guys, welcome or welcome back to my channel. I hope you guys are having a great new year. By the time I'm filming this, it's literally 2023. If you guys have any goals or things you want to accomplish in 2023, comment them down below. I hope you guys are having a great start to your 2023. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about the case of Michelle Martinko who was murdered and her case remained unsolved for 40 years until a genealogy site similar to Ancestry DNA or 23andMe solved her case. So let's get into it. Michelle Marie Martinko was born on October 6, 1961 in Cedar Rapids, Iowa to Albert and Janet Martinko. And at the time of this story, she was 18 years old and a high school senior, getting ready to graduate actually that spring. She was an above average student and she maintained very good grades and all of her teachers loved having her in their classes. She loved music and singing and at this time she was in the women's concert choir for her school. Additionally, she was in the twirling squad and did theater occasionally. People who knew Michelle described her as being mature beyond her years. She was described as really friendly, but sometimes she could be more on the quieter side, and people really noticed her beauty. Michelle was really naturally beautiful. She had beautiful blonde hair that was always styled perfectly, and she had really big brown eyes. She also always put in a lot of effort to how she presented herself, and she really loved picking out outfits and doing her makeup and styling her hair. So not only did her family take note of her beauty, but everyone around her was aware of it too. At the time of this story, Michelle was in a really good place in life. She was really confident, she was really happy, and she was really intent in her current life situation and there was nothing that was troubling her or causing her issues and it hadn't always been this way so it was kind of a sigh of relief at 12 she was actually diagnosed with scoliosis and she had to wear a back brace and this caused a lot of self insecurity for michelle she felt that she was the odd one out but at age 14 she was able to stop wearing the brace at age 16 she had just gotten her hair done and she had the in hairstyle of that time which was the farrah fawcett look and guys were really starting to notice Michelle more, even though she was unaware of it. So finally at 18, like I said, she was having the time of her life. She was doing well in school. She had a good set of friends and she was in the concert choir and she was getting ready to graduate that spring. At the time of this case, Christmas festivities were in full swing. It was only a week away from the time that this case took place. People were out doing last minute shopping, even though the weather was really chilly at this time, the Christmas cheer was still really high for the town of Cedar Rapids. Everyone was anxiously awaiting the presents under the tree and it was a really exciting time for everyone. It's always that high anticipation and buildup of Christmas Day and it was a really joyful time for everyone. December 19th, 1979 was a particularly exciting day for Michelle because she had a banquet for her concert choir that she was in. Not only was she excited for the banquet itself, but she was excited for the preparations that she would get to do because Michelle was very much a girly girl. She loved any opportunity that she could get to get all glammed up and this was the perfect chance to get all dressed up with makeup, a cute outfit, do her hair. So Michelle was pretty excited. For this day, she was wearing a black V-neck jersey material dress with a black scarf tied around her neck and pantyhose underneath her dress. She was also wearing black strappy heels. And with the cold weather being constant at this time, she was also wearing a white and brown hooded jacket that had some fur like around the collar. This is totally like Michelle to match her purse to her outfit. So she had a brown purse to match her jacket and this night her hair was either wavy or curled it's not specified so michelle goes to the banquet that night and it was at the sheraton inn which she attended with some of her friends who were also in the choir and before she left the banquet she had actually asked one of her friends if they wanted to go to the mall with her because she had to go anyways and she figured that it would be more fun to go with someone but her friend declined and ended up staying at the banquet michelle still had to go to the mall so she ended up leaving the banquet at around 8 p.m. and headed straight to the mall. So the mall she goes to is the Westdale Mall and to give a little background this was like the new and it place for the teenagers of Cedar Rapids. It had only opened a few months prior and had all of the really popular stores and then food places and all 
the shoppers in the town were really excited about the opening of this mall because it was a huge deal for this fancy new place to be built in a town like Cedar Rapids, kind of on the smaller side. Michelle brings $186 with her to the mall because she was planning on buying a coat that her mom had set on layaway for her to try on. And $186 at this time, I need to Google what inflation is now and what the price of that coat would be like because $186 in 1979 is a lot. This must have been a fancy coat. In the end though, Michelle actually decided that she didn't want this coat and she ended up just kind of browsing the mall. While Michelle was browsing, she ended up bumping into a man named Tracy Price and he went to high school with Michelle. He was in one of the choir groups as well. He had seen her actually holding out her money and he kind of jokingly said, put that away, like you don't need to be showing everyone your money. I mean, it might give them the wrong idea or someone might try and take it. Other than that, they don't really talk much other than just some quick catching up and then they move on. Michelle stays at the mall for a little bit. She's walking in and out of stores and she was last seen exiting a jewelry shop at around 9 p.m. Even though it seems like Michelle had been having a good time browsing through the mall, going in and out of stores, window shopping, it came out later that Michelle was actually kind of nervous about going to the mall in the first place because she was going alone. According to her ex-boyfriend Andy, this could be because week prior at her work she actually worked in the mall. She felt like this kind of creepy guy was watching her and it really made her feel uncomfortable and uneasy. Andy even says that for the week leading up to Michelle's death, she had been quieter than usual. Nobody that had bumped into her or talked to Michelle at the mall that day got that feeling or noticed anyone lurking around. So it's unknown whether someone was really following her, but I know that whenever I go to either like a new or unfamiliar place or a really big place, I'm suspicious of everyone. I think that everyone is watching me or everyone's looking at me and that something bad is gonna happen. And my nerves are very high, even though they probably aren't. Michelle could have been feeling like this or there could have been genuinely someone following her, but either way, she was feeling uneasy. Michelle leaves the mall right before it closes, which was at 10 p.m., so sometime a little bit before that, and at this point, it is dark and cold outside. She walks to where her car is, which is parked in the parking lot by the J.C. Penney's, and she gets in her car, she turns it on, and she's letting it warm up because she probably has to defrost her windows, her windshield, and let her engine warm up before she can drive away. So she's doing this, she's just kind of sitting there, and this is when someone quickly opens Michelle's door, pushes her to the passenger side and climbs in. At Michelle's house, her parents are growing increasingly worried as the time passes. They were expecting her home by 9.30, maybe 10 at the latest, but that time had come and go without hearing from Michelle or getting any signs of her. At first, her parents are probably there going through their mind thinking maybe she made a pit stop, maybe she got delayed, and they're just thinking that she's gonna come home a little bit later probably, and then they're gonna be like, Michelle, we were so worried about you. But the pit in their stomach keeps growing as the time keeps going on and midnight comes. And this is when our parents really start to think something could have happened. So between midnight and 2 a.m. in the morning, Michelle is reported missing by her parents after not returning home earlier that night. And police officers immediately begin a search in the area where parents believe she last was, which is around the Westdale Mall and any areas and shops around that. At 4 a.m. on December December 20th, Michelle is found slouched down in the front passenger seat of her parents' four-door yellow 1972 Buick in the parking lot by a police officer. And Michelle's death was gruesome. There was blood all over most of the interior of the car. And after an autopsy later on, it was determined that she was stabbed 29 times with stabs and cuts all over her body. The fatal stab wound that ultimately resulted in her death was to her heart, but otherwise she would have bled out either way. She had many defensive wounds on her hands, so needless to say, Michelle fought back. She really tried to save herself, and she did not go down easily. Whatever had stabbed Michelle was very sharp, and detectives to this day aren't even sure that it was a knife. They think that it could either be a knife or a dagger or something with a curved, really sharp tip. With there being so many stab wounds, it makes it seem like it's more of 
of a personal attack. So police begin to think that maybe Michelle had a connection to the killer. Police discover when they're trying to get any evidence they can from the car and Michelle that the culprit was wearing gloves and left no fingerprints, but they did find a little bit of blood on the gear shift of the car, which is next to the steering wheel. It came back as male DNA, so it was not Michelle's DNA, but unfortunately at this time there was no way to match that DNA. It wasn't really helpful at this time. Police soon ruled out sex and robbery as a motive because Michelle still had her clothes on when she was found and then after an autopsy they definitively determined that she had not been assaulted and Michelle still had her purse next to her with the money that she had brought that day to buy the coat. Later that day, which it's now December 20th, Michelle's mom Janet calls their immediate family members sobbing and unable to speak after having identified Michelle's broken and blood body as indeed Michelle. And the town was devastated and in a state of unease. All American image that the city had was shattered. If Michelle could be murdered and so brutally, then it could happen to anybody, anywhere. And at this point, detectives had no leads, so the killer is getting away with a gruesome crime. Serial killers like John Wayne Gacy, Ted Bundy, and the Zodiac Killer were running rampant in other parts of the world, but Michelle's death was a brutal reminder that not only in the outside world, but in a small town like Cedar Rapids, terrible things could happen and killers are everywhere. People began fearing for their lives. They began changing their routines and habits, going out less at night and going out more in pairs, using kind of a buddy system. And women started asking detectives on the case how they could keep their daughters safe. Michelle's father actually later on had sued them all for not doing their duty of keeping Michelle safe on their property. So there was a couple main suspects and one of those was was Michelle's ex-boyfriend, Andy. He was a year older than Michelle and they had met roller skating, but they were broken up at the time of this crime because Michelle didn't want to commit to someone at this time, which is understandable. It was a really busy and life-changing part of her life. And she is also only 18. So some of Michelle's family members immediately suspected Andy because he was known to be a little controlling and possessive of Michelle while they were dating and even more so after they had broken up. He wanted to know what she was doing, where she was doing it, who she was doing it with, if she was talking to any new guys, things like that. He was just kind of off-putting to Michelle's family and he was known to be really nosy about anything that Michelle was doing. Police had actually learned that they ran into each other at the mall at some point that day of Michelle's murder and this is when Andy immediately became a suspect because he was probably one of the last people to talk to Michelle. Police also questioned any other man who knew Michelle or who had been at the mall that day and talked to her. And only four months after her murder, police had already questioned and interviewed over 150 different suspects. They cleared three of their major suspects, including Andy, because he had an alibi. His alibi was of being home with his mom. And in the beginning, police weren't sold on this alibi because parents will do a lot to keep their kids safe. As we've probably heard about in other cases, so this might not be the best alibi, but in this case it ended up being solid and Andy was not involved. Additionally, later on after having his DNA tested, it cleared him because it did not match the DNA. At this point, police were getting desperate for something, for anything, any leads or suspects or things that could help their investigation and they were coming up with nothing. They used everything from hypnotism to psychics to polygraph tests, dozens of interviews, and so much more. Finally, in February, what they thought was the grand hurrah was announcing a reward of $10,000 to anyone who had information that would lead to Michelle's killer. Police thought that this would be the thing to bring tips in if anyone was hesitant to do it or didn't want to do it because money is a great motivator for a lot of people. But to the police's disappointment, no useful tips came forward. They were shocked to get less than a handful of calls that ended up turning up with nothing. Also, along the way of using hypnotism, police got two witnesses to provide descriptions of the believed culprit, but spoiler alert, this description looks nothing like the real 
killer. Even with all these different things that police were trying, the case goes cold. This was an extremely hard time for Michelle's parents because they are devastated. Her parents were at the point where they firmly believed and had come to terms with the fact that Michelle's murder would probably never be solved. The whole family was grieving. Michelle's mom, her dad, her sister, they were all shocked and devastated. Her mom especially took it really hard because she had suffered five miscarriages before she was even able to have Michelle. And finally, she had Michelle at age 44, which was a miracle in and of itself. And Michelle was her miracle baby. As I said, Michelle had a sister, an older sister named Janelle, but she was already moved out of the house and had kind of started her own life because they had a pretty big age gap. By this time, it felt like Michelle was an only child and with her now gone, the house grew eerily silent with no children. The daughter that Michelle's mom had wanted for so long and tried and hoped and prayed for so long was now gone with no justice being served. In 1992, when giving an interview to two Gazette writers, Michelle's mom was taking them through Michelle's old room and said that even though she didn't really like the style and she really didn't like the decorations that Michelle had in her room and how it was decorated, she kept it the exact same. Her mom also kept all of her books and personal items and mementos. Years go by until finally, on October 2nd, 2006, detectives announced that they have no new DNA in Michelle's case. Detective Doug Larson had been working on Michelle's case for a while and after going through Michelle's case files had found that the blood found on the gear shift of Michelle's car had been sent in for testing but they never bothered to get the results. He goes on the search for the lab reports and lab reports showed that the blood was not Michelle's DNA, but an unknown man's DNA. And finding this DNA for Michelle's case made him wonder if there was any more that hadn't been found or tested. He ends up sending the dress that Michelle's wearing the day of her murder in for testing. And wouldn't you know, it came back with more blood that wasn't hers. This blood also matched the blood on the gear shift so it was said that the killer likely got cut. Because Michelle had fought back, like I said, Larson uploaded the blood into CODIS, which is a huge private database that detectives and police use. It helps match samples from unsolved crimes to samples of convicted offenders that are already in the system. For example, if someone runs an unknown fingerprint in CODIS, it could be a match to an offender who robbed a convenience store all these years ago. And when he got arrested, he had to put his fingerprint into the System. Detectives run this new blood in CODIS, hoping to get a match and finally get something to find and charge Michelle's killer, but it comes back with no matches. It was a huge letdown because this means that the killer had not been arrested before, and this makes it all the more difficult to identify them because they've already gotten away with Michelle's murder and they could have done more and also not have been caught. Even though they had blood DNA and you would think that it would be so helpful and would instantly find the killer, but without anyone in the database, this DNA wouldn't be useful for another decade. Feeling the disappointment and burnout that we would probably all be feeling at this point after getting your hopes so high and trying for so long to get Michelle's killer, Detective Doug Larson ends up taking a step back from the case sometime between 2006 and 2015. After he takes a step back, they have to fill his place. So this is when Detective Matt Dellinger takes over the case. And what's crazy is that Detective Dellinger is the son to Harvey Dellinger, another detective who had worked Michelle's case since the beginning. He wasn't actively working it right now, but he had been when it had first happened. This is a crazy coincidence and it's really just a full circle moment. Matt Dellinger had told his dad when he took over Michelle's cold case that he would be the one to solve it and he did just that. After having taken over Michelle's case he figured that DNA technology must have advanced since the last time that we tried to get a match to this unknown DNA. So he figured there's something more that they can do with this information and this is when he reaches out to a company called Parabon Nanolabs and 
and they come to the rescue. Dellinger reaches out to this company to use their insane snapshot DNA phenotyping service, which basically uses blood to create a composite sketch of a suspect. So this snapshot DNA phenotyping can determine most aspects of physical appearance, such as eye color, skin color, and hair color with only your blood. This company is based in Virginia and this phenotyping has been proven helpful in solving more than 120 cases since 2018. This is a pretty expensive process, but the detectives decided to bite the bullet of doing this after years of nothing turning up. And they ended up getting a snapshot of the estimated appearance of the suspect. It was pushed out to the public through a press conference and now detectives were just playing the waiting game. For the next almost two years, the authorities got over 100 new tips and were able to rule out more than 100 people from the investigation, but they still hadn't found the actual killer. Finally, in 2018, the waiting game is over. Parabon Labs offered to upload the data from the snapshot profile of the man into a genealogy site, similar to Ancestry DNA, 23andMe, websites like that. And it was called GED Match. And the difference between trying to find a match for the DNA on here versus CODIS is that CODIS is a private DNA database that is only for people who have been arrested or detained and on the genealogy site anyone can willingly submit their DNA when they're trying to find distant relatives or information on their ethnic backgrounds and this is public information. People can submit their DNA to these genealogy sites without ever committing a crime and it's there forever. Parabon put this DNA sample into the genealogy site and the results come back they get a match. After four decades of trying to find Michelle's killer, they could be on to something huge. Sherbon's analysis of this DNA data came back with a partial match. A woman named Brandy Jennings of Vancouver, Washington shared a good portion of DNA with the unknown killer. Parabon was able to estimate from the amount of DNA shared between Brandy and the unknown killer that they were likely second cousins once removed. And family trees are really confusing to me, so I wanted to clear this up for me as well as anyone else who is totally lost. So a second cousin once removed could either be a child that your second cousin had, or it could be your parents second cousin and then that would make them your second cousin once removed and the once removed part is basically the amount of generations you are separated by okay so hopefully that cleared that up a little bit because i was was super confused after investigators and parabon were able to estimate how much brandy and the killer were related detective dellinger made a family tree which took months i can only imagine how grueling and frustrating it probably was at times as they had to start with four different sets of Brandy's great-great-grandparents. The family tree was built down from there using the internet, genealogical records, birth records, and gravestone records. After the family's tree was finished, there was quite a few living descendants and the detectives needed a way to narrow the suspect list down because it was too vast. They started trying to get buckle or buccal, aka mouth swabs, from the living descendants of this family tree. Detective Dellinger locates one of these living descendants and interviews her and she willingly gives a swab of her DNA. This woman ends up being the person to help narrow down the suspect pool to only three suspects because DNA results showed that she was first cousins with the unknown DNA and she only had three first cousins. Now there are only three possible suspects and this is when detectives go incognito undercover mode. They didn't want any of these three suspects who are all brothers to know that they were trying to get their DNA because one of them is likely Michelle's killer and if they know that police are on to them they could run away or they could refuse to give DNA or start covering their tracks so the detectives really had to be careful. They began surveilling the three brothers, Donald, Kenneth, and Jerry Burns, and slowly but sneakily collected their DNA 
until they found a match. First in Davenport, Iowa, they got a straw from one of the brothers and then next they got a toothbrush out of second brother's garbage can. They sent the items off to be tested by Parabon and after hearing back, they found out that neither of the two brothers were a match. This leaves only one possibility and now they need full confirmation. Investigators head up to Manchester, Iowa to where Jerry Burns currently resided as a 64 year old respected businessman, widower husband, and a father to three kids. They were baffled because on paper Jerry appears to be the opposite of a cold-blooded killer who would stab someone 29 times. He would have been 25 when he committed this murder. On October 29th, 2018, police are basically staking out Jerry and watching his every move and he is drinking a soda from this pizza place and after he leaves, police get the straw from the soda cup that he was drinking out of to test. They send it in for testing and what do you know, it's an exact match to the DNA found in Michelle's car. Detectives wait a little bit and they did this on purpose. They waited exactly 39 years to the date of Michelle's death to go to Jerry's powder coating business to interview him and try and get a confession out of him. They did this to maybe catch him off guard. Maybe he is reflecting on, oh, 39 years ago, I did this. But throughout the interview, Jerry showed no emotion and he gave up nothing. He didn't seem very affected or unnerved that the detectives were questioning him about this murder from all these years ago. And he denied everything. He was even answering and calls and texting people back throughout the whole interview. Jerry denied knowing or having any involvement in Michelle's murder, but they had enough DNA to prove it was him. They didn't need a confession. And this was definitely enough for an arrest. Weirdly enough, on the ride back to Cedar Rapids, Detective Dellinger was still trying to get information out of Jerry, and this is when Jerry says something a little weird. He offers up something worth considering. The detective was talking about if it's possible for someone to do a crime like this and forget, and Jerry's exact words were, I'm sure something like this would be, would be possible to block out. Like, who says that? I don't even know what to think of that. Like, that is really suspicious. On January 10th, 2019, a search warrant was issued for Jerry Burns' phone, but going through it showed that he only used his phone for making calls and texts, and there was nothing incriminating or suspicious on it. Right after that dead end, investigators get a search warrant for Jerry's house and they end up searching his computer. On this computer, they find some pretty compelling evidence via his search history. His search activity included blonde females, strangulation, assault, murder, abuse, and rape of deceased individuals and cannibalism. Needless to say, Jerry remained in jail throughout this whole thing until his trial. Also, his Bail was set at five million dollars in cash. Jerry's trial was supposed to be set for October 14th, 2019, but it ended up getting pushed back to February of 2020 after his defense team requested more time. Thursday, February 20th, 2020, the trial for Jerry Burns started and it was extremely nerve-wracking but also exciting for Michelle's family. Her sister Janelle was there along with her husband John and many of Michelle's old friends from high school were present and they all wanted Jerry to be charged and to finally pay for what he did. Meanwhile, Jerry's family was feeling the complete opposite because they were in denial and didn't believe that their brother or father or uncle or whoever could have done this. During the trial, many people were called to testify, including several of Michelle's friends and her ex-boyfriend, Andy. But the one person who gave a really eye-opening testimony was a man named Michael Anthony, who was Jerry Burns' bunkmate in county jail. And I feel like we always hear of the roommates or bunkmates or whatever you want to call them in jail ratting out on their other bunkmate because they want lesser sentence. And oftentimes criminals confess their crimes or confess incriminating evidence to their bunkmate. And Jerry Burns did just that. This Michael Anthony guy said that Jerry told him he wished he had listened to his dad and cleaned up after himself. He also said that in 1979, no one was thinking about 
DNA and that it would be a possibility. On another occasion when the two were playing cards and Michael Anthony beat Jerry, Jerry threatened to take him to the mall. The final and most disgusting thing that Jerry said to Michael Anthony was that he feels that he wins either way. He said it feels like no matter what happens he wins because he had the opportunity to be out there with his family all this time and he basically lived his life. It's insane for Jerry to say something like this and be so smug about it but it's true he did get away with Michelle's crime for all these years. Jerry got to live a normal life of graduating college, getting married, having kids, owning a business and so much more. Meanwhile Michelle's life was taken away from her before she could even graduate high school and start adulthood. It's extremely depressing. After Michael Anthony gave this testimony, it was noted that he's convicted for multiple crimes and that he would be getting a lesser sentence if this testimony was considered, though so he did have something to gain. But in my opinion, this is just Jerry showing his true colors of the evil that lurks underneath wasn't regretful for killing Michelle, he was regretful that he didn't do a better job of covering his tracks. That's just my opinion, but let me know what you guys think. Throughout the trials, Jerry was also constantly contradicting statements and also not showing much emotion again. He first said that the DNA evidence had been mishandled to try and get the DNA to not be used against him, but later denied ever being present on the night of Michelle's murder. So he's acknowledging that the DNA was there, but it's mishandled, so you can't use it. But then he's saying, well, I was never there. So then the DNA wouldn't have existed. So it just doesn't make much sense. Jerry's defense team only called one witness who was a molecular biologist. And his purpose was to talk about the transfer of DNA and how maybe Jerry touched something that Michelle touched. And that's how his DNA got in her car. The rest of the defense just attacked the integrity of the investigation and how Jerry's DNA DNA was taken and that that was a violation of his Fourth Amendment rights, but that was about it. Four days later, on February 24th, 2020, deliberations begin and only three hours later, the jury has a verdict. Jerry Burns was found guilty of first degree murder. And in comparison to most other trial deliberations, this trial was very quick. All of the jury members who consisted of men and women came to the conclusion that Jerry was guilty very quick. With the evidence presented and how Jerry probably presented himself during the trial, it must have been pretty evident that he definitely did this. Unfortunately, by the time that Jerry was identified and arrested, Michelle's parents had long since passed away in 1995 and 1998. But either way, Michelle has finally gotten the justice she deserves after the last four decades of no answers. Her friends and family were very emotional and thankful toward the detectives on Michelle's case and they finally felt some semblance of peace knowing that Michelle's murderer had finally been charged. Jerry's family was in a level of shock that he was actually charged and his attorney refused to comment to the press. Later in May of 2020, Jerry's attorney tried to say that since investigators took Jerry's DNA without him knowing and therefore could have used the DNA for other purposes, it is a violation of his rights. Iowa law states that DNA can only be used to identify a person during a criminal investigation and Jerry's attorney said that they could have used it for other purposes and to convict him as a killer. Whatever those other purposes are, I don't know. This argument went nowhere and a motion filed by Jerry's attorney during the time of his sentencing in August also went nowhere. On August 7th, 2020, Jerry Burns was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for first degree murder. And in Iowa, they don't have capital punishment, aka the death sentence. So this is the highest charge he can get. He was also ordered to pay $150,000 to the estate of Michelle Martinka. Jerry Burns is currently in prison in the Anamosa State Penitentiary in Iowa and will be in jail till the day he dies. Although this case seems like it has a, a happily ever after and I guess it does in the sense that Jerry did eventually pay for his crime and he will never get out of jail. Michelle is still gone and nothing will bring her back. 
her parents had to live with that up until their deaths and her family, her living family, is still dealing with that every day. Although some semblance of peace and closure was given to Michelle's case and the killer was finally caught and is at least facing some consequences, it still went unsolved for 40 years. Michelle will never get back the time that she lost. She will never get to do the things that all teenagers should get to do, like graduate high school and go to college and start a family and that is ultimately a tragedy. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this case. I wanted to do a solved case after the last case was unsolved, and I found this case really interesting with the use of a genealogy site like Ancestry DNA proving helpful to find a killer and how advancements in d DNA technology can find a killer with only a little bit of DNA. Anyways, don't forget to do all that YouTube stuff that you know how to do. Like, subscribe, comment your thoughts and opinions and how your New Year's was, and I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Bye guys!